can't separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have no mercy for me every day Your love never fails Your love never changes But maybe pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me open seas Cause your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Cause your love never fails You said the same through the Ages. Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the ocean drains I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Together for my good You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Yeah. 
lips Hate the love of the land Or the government But it's all Good morning, church. It is so good to see you this morning. Have I told you that I love you lately? I love you all so much. Miss seeing you and, and hugging you and holding you. Um, and soon and very soon, we'll get back to that, hopefully. Right, today is our graduation Sunday, and we're here to celebrate our high school graduates. And, and kiddos, I, I want you to understand that we know this has been a difficult spring for you. It's been a, one for all of us. But we are so proud of you and your accomplishments, and we celebrate you on this day. Uh, we ask you this morning to be in prayer for them over the next week or so as they still continue this journey toward graduation and what that might look like. This morning, we're still in our series called Home Improvements. It's been a great series. We love talking about the family. And I would just ask you now to grab your Bibles, grab a pen and your note page, 
Get your coffee, get your kiddo settled. It's going to be a great morning. Pastor Cindy has a great word for us today, and we look forward to what God is going to do in our midst. We love you, Crossroads. Have a great morning. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercy for me every day Your love never fails Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Hey Crossroads Seniors, I just want to tell you guys that I am so proud of you. Um, graduating from high school is not a small a small um, achievement and you guys have done it. It's, it's a huge thing. You've just finished grade school and now y'all are about to go either to college or into the workforce. And this is a moment in everybody's life where there's quite this feeling of transition right you feel that things are about to change and they are um, but for the better for the good they're going to change in a way that provides you with opportunities to meet new people to um, share your story with new people to hear other people's stories um, and so i just hope and pray that as you guys go into these different um parts of your life, whether it be the workforce or college, um, that you would be looking for those opportunities to meet new people and to share what God has done in your life with new people. Um, and I know also with graduating and moving, kind of moving on to the next phase of your life, sometimes that comes along with a little bit of anxiety and it also comes with excitement and joy um, and so it's just this bittersweet mixture of emotions right and so um, I just wanted to read a scripture over you guys that has just always been really um, helpful for me in these times of transition because this is not going to be the only time of transition in your life it's one of many and so I just hope that this scripture will encourage you guys the way that it encourages me and remind you guys that God is with you in every transition, in every lull, in every moment. Okay, so um, it's from Ephesians chapter 3 and it's verse 20 and 21 and I'm going to read it for you guys. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Um, so this verse for me has just always been a reminder that God is with me in everything and he is the one who empowers me and strengthens me to do all of, all of the things that I've been able to do um, since I graduated high school. And he's the one who's going to empower you and strengthen you to do all of the things that you do after you graduate from high school. And so um, I just hope that you guys are um, excited about this next phase of your life. And I hope that you go into it um, just expectant for God to do amazing things. Because I know I expect Him to do amazing things in your life and um, through your life. And so um, I just, I love you guys. And I wish I could just 
see you guys in person and give you all a big hug and congratulate you in person. Um, but this is what we are, we have been dealt. Um, and so hopefully once we get back to going to church in person, I can again congratulate all of you guys and give you hugs and shake your hands and just, you know, do all the things that I wish I could have done today for you guys. Um, but yeah, I love you guys and I miss y'all. Um, and I just wish you guys all of the luck in the world. Hey guys, uh, this being the the morning that we were supposed to celebrate our, our graduating seniors. And so Morgan and I put together these little videos just to kind of share a word with you uh, this morning um, about graduation. And so we wanted to do that right here with me. I, I want to share a story with you to get with you guys. But here I got a I got a two dollar bill. Uh, they are real. I've had people say, man, are those fake? No, they're real. They're only worth two dollars, but they're real. Uh, and, and this is a unique uh, current uh, money, if you will. You don't see a lot of these going around. They're pretty unique. Um, just like every one of you guys who are graduating are unique. Um, I wanted to share a story with you from a coach that, uh, that a coach shared with me. I wanted to share that with you real quick. It's about a coach. I love sports. I wanted to be a coach my whole life. I love doing that. I love sports. I love teenagers. I love kids. I love teaching. Uh, I love playing the game. I, I just, that level of competition. I just love all those things. Um, and so this morning I want to share a story uh, that stuck with me from when I was in high school too. And so it's a story, you guys aren't going to know who this is, but it was a coach of the Oklahoma Sooners back in the 50s and 60s. His name was uh, Bud Wilkinson, right? And he had consistently had undefeated teams that just steamrolled their oppositions. Uh, and upon his retirement to the broadcast booth, Coach Wilkinson was asked uh, what his secret was to his success. How could he consistently mold these young athletes into these powerful teams year after year after year? Uh, and this was, this was his answer to that question. He says, when a football player goes into a game, he can play to a variety of audiences. He can play for the crowd in the stands, uh, maybe working for their cheers and avoiding their booze, or he might play for that special person that's sitting in the stands, maybe a girlfriend or a mom or whoever it may be. <clears throat> and some players may allow the other team to dictate, dictate their play. In other words, if the man across the line from him isn't very good, then maybe he doesn't play very good. And if the opponent cheats, well then maybe he cheats, right? Some football players would even allow their teammates to determine the quality of their play. Some would focus on the officials, the referees. Uh, of course, some would merely play for themselves to be the star. Uh, there were many, many, many audiences who would be for the attention of the players. But he said his men knew that there was only one person watching the game that mattered. And that person, and one person that, that they had to please, and that was him. That was their coach. Regardless of the cheers or the boos or the strength of the opposition, the fairness of the officials uh, or the play of their teammates, he was the only audience that counted. And he said when everyone knew that and that they played that way, that they would pull together, do their best and give it all and win. And so my word to you would be this, as you guys graduate uh, high school now, and you're going to kind of go out into the world a little bit, whether it be into the workforce or it be to college. Um, there's going to be a lot of audiences trying to get your attention. There's going to be a lot of different things going on in life, even more so than there is now. And so to be rooted in the fact that you uh, only have this one life, right? I got this one $2 bill. I can take this $2 bill and I can spend it, but I can only spend it once. And so your life is kind of unique, like this $2 bill, but you can only spend it one time. And so how are you going to spend that life? Uh, my challenge to you would be to spend that life like Coach Wilkinson's uh, athletes, like his players, spent their uh, game time playing for that audience of one, for playing for that coach. The audience that we play our life for, that we live our life for, is for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we realize that, that that's the only audience that we have to please, that that's the only one that we have to strive for, that that's the only one that it really matters uh, what thinks about us, right? So when we've achieved that, when we live a life that looks to be pleasing to him, that we will have been successful. So 
as you guys go out there, uh, remember that. Remember to live life for the audience of one, uh, the, the only one that matters, and that's Jesus. So, hey, congratulations, guys. We're proud of you. Uh, wish we could see y'all in person, but this is what we got for now. You guys take it easy and be good.
There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the we come before you this morning thankful for that love thankful for that sacrifice God and we are in awe of you this morning 
we are in awe of your power, your mercy, your grace. God, and your love for sinners. So God, we come before you this morning, confess that, that we do fall short, way short of what you would have for us. God, but we know that your redemption makes up for that. God, that through the sacrifice of Jesus, we are perfect in your eyes. So God, we are humbled by that reminder this morning. God, we're humbled to be in your presence. So God, we ask that as we worship, that your presence would be felt by each and every member of this community, each and every person worshiping now at home, watching, watching this on their computer, on their TV, on their phone. God, that we would be joined together as a community in worshiping you. God, we ask that you speak to us today. Begin to mold us and change us and shape us to what you want us to be. For we give it all to you this morning. We pray all of this in your perfect and holy name. Amen. Good morning, Crossroads. I'm so glad to see you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you've joined us this morning, and I'm excited about this message that God has laid on my heart. I hope it really uh, speaks to you. But I want to start this morning with something for the kids. So kids, listen up, pay attention. Um, I'm going to hold something up, and I want you to come close, and I want you to look at what I'm holding up. Can you see it? Come up close so you can see. Do you know what that is? Let me hear you. What is it? Okay, it's a button. You're right. It's a button. It fell off a jacket. I found it in my drawer the other day, and it helped me begin to think about how a button might help us grasp the idea of our lesson today as we look into God's Word. So I'm going to ask you kiddos to do two things for me today. One, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to go look around your house and see if maybe you have a button. See if maybe you have a button that you could bring into the room or just go in your closet and grab a shirt that has buttons on it if you can't find one. But I want you to have a button and then I want you to get some paper and something to write with and I want you to draw me a picture of a button. Maybe you'll draw several buttons on there. Um, maybe you'll draw a buttons that look like a flower. I don't know, but whatever you draw, I want you to draw a button or some buttons for me. I want your mom and dad to take a picture of it. And then I want them to post it on our Facebook page. And I want to be able to see all your pictures about a button. And then later you can hang that picture on your refrigerator. And it will remind you and your family this week of some things that might help you and how we grow closer to God and love him more. So get busy, find your button, find your paper, find your colors and markers, and get busy drawing me a picture with a button on it. Now, parents... I'll talk to you for a second, because what I need you to do is to get your Bibles and open them to Genesis, Genesis chapter 22. That's where we're going to be today. It's easy, quick to find. Just get your Bible open and ready there while the kids are getting all their stuff ready to go. While you're doing that and getting all that kind of settled, I want to direct your attention over here to have something on the stage, this sweater right here. Now, you look at the sweater, and I wonder if you noticed that the buttons are actually buttoned wrong. How many of you have ever done this before? Go ahead, just admit it. Throw a little sign up, throw your hand up, admit it. I've done this several times before. Start buttoning up the sweater and it ends up wrong. Or if you have a child or me with my grandkids, I change a diaper and I'm snapping all those little snaps and I get up to the top and I'm off by one and I've got to unsnap them all and start all over again. It's crazy. Um, but today I want to talk about the fact that sometimes when we button up and things are wrong, it gets everything else out of sync, like the rest of the things don't match up. And that's what I want to talk to you about. In fact, I was thinking about this, and I started thinking about Mr. Rogers. I watched it growing up as a kid, and I thought, oh, Mr. Rogers used to button up his sweater. I, I could use a clip or something. So I went looking for a clip. Well, he zips up his sweater, and I'm like, I know that he used to button up a sweater. So I did a little bit more research and come to find out the very first season of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in 1968 
he actually had a button-up sweater. And on one of his episodes, he actually buttoned his sweater wrong. And when he got to the top, he just used it in that moment. And he just kind of talked to the kids and said, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and we do things wrong, but we can just unbutton it and fix it and make it right again. And that was such a great analogy. And so I wanted to use that this morning as we talk through the mission of God and what that means for us and we're, as we're discipling our families, discipling our kids, and discipling uh, people that God brings into our life. So I wonder, first of all, do you feel like your, the, this sweater represents how sometimes you maybe feel you don't get that discipling thing right, that you struggle with it, that nothing lines up, that, it, that by the time you kind of get into it, it's, everything is off, it's not lined up right. And I wonder if that's because the top button that top button has to start first. And so I want to talk to you today about what, I'm, what I want to call a top-down truth. In other words, if we get the top button lined up first and everything else below that will fall into place. And I think the same is true when we begin to think about the mission that Jesus gave us. He said we are disciples first and foremost, followers of him, disciples of him, and we also are to disciple other people. And that means our children, our families, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers. And I wonder if maybe we had this truth, this one top-down truth secured, buttoned up, that if we had that in place, that everything else would feel like it wasn't so overwhelming and that discipling piece might fall into place a little bit better. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, that maybe our buttons need to be reset. After all, Mr. Rogers says, sometimes when things don't line up, it's okay to start over. And so we're going to be in Genesis 22, and I want to share with you a story that many of you might be familiar with. Some of you may be hearing this story for the first time. It's, it's probably one of the most harrowing, bizarre, crazy stories in Scripture that we read, which I'm sure you're probably really excited right now uh, that we're going to tackle this Scripture and this passage and this story, but it's the story of Abraham and Isaac. And so before we dive into that, I just want to check back with the kids. Kids, how are you doing on drawing your picture of the buttons? I hope that's going really good. I can't wait to see the pictures that you draw and that you post. I'm looking forward to that. But as we're going through there and you're doing the buttons, in a little bit I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about what that button means. So Genesis 22, verse 1. I'm reading from the message translation, so as you're following along, it might sound a little bit different, but it might add some insight as to understanding this story. It says, after all this, God tested Abraham. God said, Abraham, yes, answered Abraham. I'm listening. Now, before we go any further, just a couple of things, because it says, after all of this. And so there was a journey and a history that Abraham had with God. So he's saying, after all of this, after God said to Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of you, I'm going to create a great nation, and, and Abraham knew that he had no children, and that he and Sarah were way past age to be able to bear children, and God then gave them a child, and he had a son, and that promise was fulfilled. So there is this history that Abraham has with God. And so after all of this, God decided to test Abraham. And what I think is interesting about just this one verse is that when God said that, Abraham said, yes, I'm listening, as if this is normal. This, this is just how our conversations go. This is what happens with uh, Abraham and God. But he said, yes, I'm listening. And so he goes on in verse 2, and this is what God says to him. He said, take your dear son Isaac. Your translation might say, your one and only son. Remember, this was the only son that Isaac had. It was the son given to him as a promise to fulfill the great nation that God was going to build through um, Abraham's son Isaac. So he says, take that son, that one and only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll point you to. Now, I don't know about you, but just that right there, 
Abraham says, I'm listening. So we know Abraham heard this. We know he heard God say to take his son and sacrifice him, which feels so contrary to who Abraham knew God to be. Also within this context of this task that, this test that he gave him, he says the word love for the first time. He says, take your one and only son whom you love. And, and that's the first time that's been said. Maybe the first time Abraham's heard that. There is this um, intensity of love. If you look at kind of that word and how God used that in that moment. But an intensity of love between that father and son relationship. Between Abraham and Isaac. Remember, Isaac was everything to Abraham. It was the promised son. It was the son he thought he would never have. The son that would be his inheritance, that would carry on his legacy, that would take care of him in his old age. Like Isaac was everything to Abraham. And, and God saying, take that one son. I also think there's a little bit in there that maybe God was saying there's an intensity of love between the relationship between Abraham and God. So he introduces this idea connected to this test that he gives him. And you might be saying, why would God do this? Why would God ask Abraham to do this? Now, Abraham is not unfamiliar with this kind of pagan sacrifice. He had moved to a land where this is what they did. So he wasn't unaware that this happened, but it was contrary to who he understood God to be. And so why this sacrifice? But what I think is interesting is that Abraham said, I'm listening and what we know is the intensity of that love between Abraham and God came through because what happens next is that it says in verse 3, Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants and his son Isaac. He had split wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had directed him. In other words, Abraham immediately did exactly what God told him to. He didn't fret. He didn't argue with God. He didn't have some conversation. He just said, I'm listening. He heard what God told him, and he followed through the way he and God had always worked. He saddled his own donkey. He went and cut the wood for the burnt offering. He did all of that. He, he didn't ask his servants to. Abraham was being obedient like he always had. And then it says, on the third day, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham told his two servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Now, the third day means for three days, Abraham sat in this agonizing place. I I'm a parent and I can't even imagine, but I remember when we lost Emily for about 25 or 30 minutes one time. And she was just two years old. And when that happened, I felt sick to my stomach. I, I could throw up. Like I, there was just, just this nut, gut-wrenching feeling inside my stomach. Maybe you've had that feeling before uh, in some circumstance or maybe with one of your children. But that I can just imagine Abraham feeling the intensity of that for those three days. Three days, he had opportunity to turn around and go back. Three days, he had opportunity to change his mind. But on that third day, Abraham took his son and he told his servants, I'm going to go over here and worship, but we're going to be back. I think the intensity of what Abraham knew in his heart from God is that this was a test from God because he had listened and said that God was going to test him. And so I think Abraham thought, I'm, I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to keep what I know about God at the forefront. In other words, Abraham had that top button secure. Like his love for God and God's love for him was guiding everything that he did where he didn't question that, that intensity. I, I don't think Abraham even wondered at that moment what God was going to do to fix this situation. I just think G Abraham knew that he was secure in who God was and in their relationship. And he just kept walking forward. The circumstances to Abraham said that everything was off. Everything was out of line. Nothing was right. But in Abraham's heart, that top button was secure and Abraham kept walking forward. See, the test from God was about what Abraham believed. He loved God most 
more than Isaac, more than the promise. It was this top-down truth. He loved God the most. Now, I want to stop for a minute, and I want to go back, and I want to look at your note page, because I want to talk to you about the fact that there was this top-down truth that Abraham had, and I want us to go ahead and write that down on your note page, write it somewhere in paper, maybe write it on the paper where your kid is drawing the button. But I want you to be able to see the rest of this story through the eyes of this truth that I think Abraham had secured that top button on. That top-down truth says, we love others best when we love God most. We love others best when we love God most most. That connects right directly into Deuteronomy 6 that we've been studying, the Shema, where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You can go and read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where they repeat that information and they say it again and Jesus repeats it and he uses it and he says it's about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then in Matthew 28 when he says, go and make disciples, right there wrapped up in this one statement is this mission we're called to. The mission that says we've got to love God and we've got to go and disciple people, make disciples. And so if we are, we have that top button secure like Abraham did, when, when we know that we love others best because we love God most, then all of those other things fall into place. And I think that's the place that Abraham was functioning out of. So I want to move on into the story. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he gave it to Isaac, his son, to carry. He carried the flint and the knife. The two of them went off together. So Abraham had the wood. Abraham had the knife. He had followed through on everything. Isaac said to Abraham, his father, Father, yes, my son, we have flint and wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham said, Son, God will see to it. In other words, God will provide that there is a sheep for the burnt offering. God will see to it and provide a sheep for the burnt offering. And they kept on walking. Like, it, typically with a kid, you know, there's 50 questions, but they kept walking. That top-down truth Abraham was clinging to. His love for God over everything. He wasn't trying to sneak out of this. He brought the knife. He brought the wood. He showed up to the place. He built the altar because he was secure in God's love and his love for God. He believed God would provide. He believed all the other buttons would line up and fall into place because Abraham's top button was secure. It goes on to say in verse 9, they arrived at the place to which God had directed him. Abraham built an altar, he laid out the wood, then he tied up Isaac and laid him on the wood. Abraham reached out, took the knife to kill his son. This is the part of the story that I really want us to pay attention to with new eyes. Isaac was probably, I don't know, 15, a teenager, older, young, strapping guy. Abraham was old, like super old, like really, really old. Yet, he tied up Isaac. Isaac could have run, and his dad could have never caught him. Or at least he could have fought off his dad. But when you read that story, Isaac was as obedient as Abraham in following through on this test. I'm thinking, why did Isaac cooperate with his dad? I think he allowed him to tie him up and lay him on the altar and to raise that knife Don't miss this. Because for 15 years, Isaac had watched the faith of his father. The faith of his father with his God. Every day he had seen Abraham live that faith out. I'm guessing that they had had conversations about all the things that God had done before Isaac ever even showed up on the scene. I'm thinking that a thousand times Abraham told Isaac, God promised me a child and you are that child and you are that promise from God and, and God is faithful. I mean, the, a, the faith of Abraham was that it discipled Isaac to a faith like his father's. 
I mean, I think this is what is so incredibly unique about this story that sometimes we may have never seen before and never thought about in light of this. But I think there is something here for us to see about how Abraham discipled his son, how he did it well, how he did it in in the obedience of how he lived out day in and day out. His top-down faith, secure, buttoned up, tight, where he didn't waver at all. I, I I wonder, what does it make you think about when you think about how you disciple your children, how I disciple my children? our friends, our neighbors, how are we living out our faith on a daily basis that says to people that God is important, the most important thing to you? I mean, do you love God most? I mean, that, that question right there, Abraham did. That's a question we have to ask ourselves. It's a hard truth. You're discipling your children no matter what. No matter what, you are discipling your children. The question for us today is, are we discipling them to a faith to love God most or to a faith that places idols above our love for God, that places other things and other people above our love for God? It's interesting as we go on and read the rest of the story, it says in verse 11, just then an angel of God called him. So the knife is raised and an angel called out and it said, Abraham, Abraham, Again, Abraham says, yes, I'm listening. Don't lay a hand on that boy. Don't touch him. Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. See, I don't think God was looking for information from Abraham to pass a test like we would pass a multiple choice test. I think God was looking to see if he could push his faith in obedience and trust God wanted to know, do you love me the most? It reminds me of when Jesus said to Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? See, we can't live out the mission God has given us if we don't love God most so that we can love others best. There is no room for us to love anything above God. Abraham couldn't love his son above God. No idols, nothing more important than our love for God. God knows that if we can love him with an intensity of love that puts God top priority, top button, top on the shelf, then everything else about how we disciple and love people best falls right into place. All the buttons line up. And then the story ends, it says, Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You didn't hesitate to place your son, your dear son, your only son on the altar for me. Abraham looked up. He saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. On that mountain, Abraham named it the place God Jaira. God sees to it. God provides. That's when we get that saying, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. See, Abraham didn't test God. Abraham didn't uh, not decide to do the sacrifice. Abraham didn't turn around. He didn't change his mind. You know, he could have named that the mountain of testing. He could have named it the mountain of the sacrifice, but he chose to name it The mountain that God provides, God sees to it because that's what he believed about his God. Now, I know this is a crazy story when we we think about it in today's time, like that would never happen. But it's something we wouldn't expect in Scripture, but it's pivotal. It's pivotal to the story and it's pivotal to our story, to how God wants to work in our life. I think it helps us understand God's expectations for us as a believer, as a disciple of Christ. God gives all of us good gifts. I've heard so many of you say, gosh, I'm so blessed. I I love my job. I love love what I do. Many of you say, most days you love your kids. Um, You love your church. See, God gives us all these good things, but 
can we love it without worshiping it? That, that's the real test God calls us to, to become disciples for him. Can we love him most so that we can disciple other people best? Are we loving the things we love more than the creator and giver of those good gifts? Our blessings should move us to love the creator more than the gifts and the blessings. Anything that pulls our love away from the Lord is an idol. And our love has become disordered. The buttons are out of place. They're off. There's no top-down truth to keep us lined up on God's mission. So what or who has been pulling you away from loving God more? Where do you have disordered love? What idol has your buttons out of line? Here's what I think happens. We take something that is good, a relationship, a job, a career, our kids, our spouse, and we put it on the top shelf of our life and we make it most important and we love it most. And I would just ask you, how's that working for you? It didn't work for me very well. I can remember many times where it did not work for me because the end result is always disappointment. When we get the good things out of order and put them on the top shelf where God belongs, our buttons are going to be off. We're going to be disappointed. See, we need to call it what it is. We are worshiping an idol. No one consciously wants to pull God from the top shelf. No one wants family or kids or hobbies, career, stuff to come before God. In our minds, we know that's not right. But what we know and what we do always, sometimes it doesn't match up. So I want to give you a quick test this morning. I'm going to make it easy for you. True and false. Okay? Here's the first question. We probably miss participating in biblical community about 50% of the time because of extra activities like sports, hobbies, travel, or combination of all of those and other things. True or false? 50%. See, if God looked at our calendar and our checkbook, what would it say about who's on the top shelf of our life? What does our schedule, our calendar, our checkbook say to our kids about what is most important? How are we discipling that information that God is the most important thing? How are we dis using God in the top shelf as a way to disciple our kids. But at the same time, when we remove him from that shelf, what kind of faith are we discipling our kids and our family and our friends and our neighbors in? Who do you love most? Who you love most determines how you disciple. Question two. I'm in a relationship that dishonors God. True or false? See, why does the relationship get top priority over God? Why don't we simply say, I know that God is the God who provides, and I'm not going to do anything in this relationship that puts that above a God that I believe provides, a God that I love the most, that I'm going to keep on the top shelf, and I'm not going to let that relationship dictate how I live my life. I'm going to trust God. See, relationships speak volumes about where our love for God is. Do your relationships reveal a top-down truth about who you know God to be? Or is there a relationship that has all your buttons off, messed up, out of sync? Question three. Do you make sacrifices for people more than you do for God? True or false? Do you make sacrifices for people more than you do for God? It's, it's not that making sacrifices aren't a necessary part of raising kids or doing our job or helping out a friend or a neighbor, 
But here's where I think we get tripped up. We try to live by a top-down truth to keep everything in order and God first, but our efforts are made out of our own willpower. Like we're trying to do this on our own. And that's when our buttons get out of line. Our motivation must come from the intensity of the love we have for God, just like Abraham did with his God. The, the intensity of the love that you have for your children has to pour over into, translate into an intensity of love that you have for God first and foremost. If the top button, if that top button isn't secure in that, everything else is not going to fall into place in how you disciple and how you live out the mission of God. Abraham had an intense love for God. He came at the willingness to sacrifice his son. That's how intense his love was for God. See, Abraham's faith was not in the promise that God gave him about a son and a nation. Abraham's faith was in the promise keeper, the one who was going to keep that promise. He didn't mix those two things up. He believed all the buttons would lined up because he knew who God was and loved him first and foremost. And a ram appeared. A son was spared. A nation was built. And, and let's not forget this. Years later, a one and only son would love his father so intently that he would sacrifice himself so all the buttons of your life could line up. See, I think today we stand at a crossroads of idol worship, if you will. Buttons out of place. Life out of kilter. How do we get that top button back and secure? How do we not abandon the mission of God that he's given us? I think what we do at this crossroads in recognizing that we may be in a place where our buttons are off because there is an idol in our life that is keeping us from our mission. I mean, we have an option. One, we can worship an idol. We can put it on the top shelf. We can live our life that way. Our buttons out of sync, disappointed. Or option two, we can worship God and love him most so we love others best. To live out the mission God has called us to with an intensity of love that has already been demonstrated to us through Christ. See, the story of Abraham was just the beginning of the ultimate discipling illustration. When Jesus entered this earthly existence, when he came to earth in human flesh, he trusted God as the one who would provide. Jesus kept God on the top shelf of his earthly life. He lived by a top-down truth. As Jesus in the flesh, he loved his Father most. And in turn, he loved us best. Look at the progression of the discipleship lived out in Jesus' top-down truth. In John 5, it says, So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. Look at that discipling illustration there. Jesus, everything the Father did, Jesus was listening for, watching for, being obedient to. Exactly what we saw in Abraham. In John 14, it says, I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Those are Jesus' words. It, it, it sounds like that love that we heard in Genesis 22. That intensity of love that Jesus had for his Father and do exactly what his Father has commanded him. And then 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. There's this pattern of who the Father is and the intensity of love in the Father and what the Father commanded him to do. And Jesus then doing that and living that out so that we too could be discipled in that same way. It's full circle 
as we come back to our mission given to us by Jesus to make disciples, to disciple people, to see a faith that shows them God is provider and that we love him most, allows that faith to be transferable into the lives of the people God puts in our pathway, puts in our path to disciple our family, our kids, our neighbors, our coworkers. This is how God calls us to disciple. The mission is simplified, I think, today, which is the idea of the button. You will love others best when you love God most. Get that top button secure so that everything else you attempt to do falls out of that one secure thing. It influences everything else. And God makes sure all of those things line up beyond that. When loving God is our top down truth, everything else falls into place. The best way to disciple your kids is to remove the idols from your life and love God most so you can love them best. When you love God most, you show your family a faith in God that they will then live out. I want to walk you through a prayer to close today that I hope will help you begin to live this top-down truth, to get that top button secure. And as I read this prayer to you, it's on your note page as well, but you'll hear this prayer sung in the song that the band is going to close us with today. I think the first thing we have to do is repent. We have to repent and, and get rid of the idols a prayer would be, Father, I repent, I repent and come to you humbled by my sin. Lord, cast down all my idols. Do not let me lift my soul to another. The second thing is we have to replace, like we have to pull something out and replace Jesus and put him back as the king of our life. Replace him back on the top shelf or maybe even today, You've never placed Jesus on the top shelf of your life. You, you've never made that decision to make him the Lord of your life. I, I just want to say to you today that I would love to visit with you about that. In the comment section, there'll be a place where you can click on a connect card and you can share that with us and, with us and we'd be glad to follow up with you. But maybe today for you, it's that moment at a crossroads where you say, I'm going to put God the top shelf of my life. I'm going to secure that top button so the rest of my life begins to fall into place. Third, renew. Daily love God most so you can love others best. The prayer would be, Holy Spirit, renew my mind and heart daily to love others best because I love God most. May I seek your face, O God of Jacob. And then fourth, restore. See, there's time to unbutton and rebutton the sweater. There's time to get that top button secure. It, there's still, still time to disciple your kids and family well. Pray a prayer that says, God, restore my faith as a testimony to you as provider. Allow my faith to disciple the next generation into their faith. So I want to challenge you today to take down those idols, cast them out, rebutton and secure that top button so that you can love others best because you love God most. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for the story of Abraham and Isaac. God, for how we saw an example that we are discipled by Abraham's example. God, we see how important it is because of the influence it had on Isaac. And God, may we keep the mission that you've given us at the forefront by just simply loving others best because we love you most. God, may we be followers of Jesus this week who move you back to the top shelf that we find ways to express how much we love you. And God, that we live that out in such a way our kids have absolutely no doubt that we love God most. And God, may that pour over into how we love them best and disciple them into that same kind of faith. In your name we pray, amen. 
I hope you enjoy this song that the band is playing and read that prayer and let that song be your prayer. Crossroads family, man, we just want to say thank you for joining us online together today. I know that together feels weird and we greatly anticipate and look forward to the day we get to gather together again. 
If you notice, I'm having a little trouble with my shirt. You know, if we, as we talked just now with Cindy, she was kind of unpacking this idea that, that God is a top button, that God is the priority. And sometimes getting that just right and making sure that everything lines up exactly as it should takes work. It takes practice. Sometimes it even takes a mirror. It takes looking at someone else doing it for you to have a place of understanding this is exactly how it works. So as I'm sitting here getting this lined up, I want you to know that this takes some practice. This even took a couple of shots today to make sure that I got this right for you. But the idea is that, is that this takes work. Following Jesus takes work. Putting God as the best thing in your life, it takes work and it takes time. And the same for our children, helping them understand how to do this it's going to take not just today and not just tomorrow, but it's going to take a lifetime of you pouring into them and being a disciple maker for them. And we want to connect with you this week. If there is any way that we can be journeying with you, if there's any way we can be praying for you, then you can contact us at 254-848-9789. Or you can go to our Connect card that is at extrasonline.org slash connect. We'll also drop a link for it right here in the chat if you want to connect with us. But let us know how we can be journeying with you helping you get everything in line just as it should, not so that we can look perfect and look good, but so that we are doing our best to honor God with everything we are and everything that he is doing in our lives. So we love you. We look forward to connecting with you throughout this week. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see you right here throughout the week. Love you, Crossroads.
It's your end. 